You have no power here. Be gone before somebody drops the house on you too. Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where and when you're watching this broadcast. I'm Thomas Fester, and this is Disclosure Tonight. Happy Monday. It's that day of the week, down to the hour, minute, and second, that we come together as a community to put everything we know in a box and put it on the shelf like it doesn't exist. As we come together to talk about those things the government won't, to talk about those things from science fiction, more importantly, to talk about those things from the X-Files. What are we talking about? We're talking about those things you can go out and see over your house some evenings. But you just have to look up. What the hell am I talking about? Well, we're talking about good old-fashioned UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Well, we know they're trying to change up the words on this. There's a word for UFOs in every single language around the world throughout perpetuity. So why mix it up? It's the government's chance to go ahead and try and confuse everybody to distract them from their 75-year war against the non-human intelligence that they've been war uh, waging out in the open in plain sight. How do we know? Everything we see is about the military. Everything we see is about the, is from the war machine. They're going to take whatever they can to rip the technology out of the dying hands of the extraterrestrials that are visiting us to use that power for their war machine. It's not about saving humanity. It's not about saving the planet. It's about building weapons of mass destruction. And our government doesn't want to let any of this information get out because if it could, it's happening in every single other country around the world. So the only people they're really hiding it from is all of us. That's why together, many nights a week, we come together as a community to go ahead and turn down the idiots in the White House and call out these bozos in the DOD to say, you know what, we're tired of your games, we're tired of your misinformation and disinformation, and we're going to talk about it on disclosure tonight good evening everybody hope the hell your day has been better than mine oh holy shit literally but i have to say that did inspire me for today's show <laughs> for the open we're gonna get into here we're gonna do a quick uh conversation here on uh well some news that are going on then we're gonna jump into a segment um on some things that happen are happening with SCU, and, the, and then in the second hour of the show, we're going to be diving in with Tom King on the whole, uh, what do you call it, um, Phoenix Lights event. It, it's the anniversary today, and it's something we have to go ahead and cover. Do I? F and on that note, let's go ahead and get to the audience and get to people so we can get this thing rolling. Hello, everyone. Good to see you, DC. Welcome to the show. Susan goes, time goffs, time traveling pangolins. Yes. Phoenix Lights occurred on March 13th, 1987. Gray Troll is around. Good to see you. DC is here. Fascinated by the Phoenix Lights. I think we'll, uh, we all are in our second hour. That's going to be one hell of a conversation, to say the least. Let's see who else we have out there. John Dellinger, you're around. Kelly Bro, happy Monday, everyone. Purple Hearts. Yeah, good old me. Uh, sick as hell today, honestly. I feel horrible from all this shit, literally, and hope the show pulls me out of it for a bit. Expect a shorter than usual tonight. We'll see how long I can pull on today. Uh, better yet, let's see how far the guests can pull me along today. I'm looking forward to it. Great troll. Good to see you, my friend. John Dillinger, I welcomed you already. Mike Sukoloff. Uh, Sekloff. Sekloff. Gotcha. Third time's a charm. Mike is in the chat, and he's in the back, I think. We'll be talking. Maybe not. I think we're close. Talk to you shortly. It's one of those days I am just a little bit off. Well call it a lot off but that's okay avi m hello everyone don't stress it thomas take care oh you're gonna see avi <laughs> we're gonna be having a good time inspired by one of your posts on twitter i'm so happy that you can make it here today kelly bro thank you very much for the nice wishes our ranch air gun fun channel Artie, get over here Artie. that is the cue to tell Artie don't eat cupcakes food if you want a cookie come to me We'll give it to you. Just don't take the old girl's food. I am not prepared for that. Ryan Baker, good to see you, my friend. Misty Rain, welcome to the show. Good to see you today. Who else we have out there? Owen from Ohio. Good to see you, Owen. Xavier Gamer is around. Hi, Thomas and Cupcake. Luckily, Cupcake is snoozing right now. 
Let's see how long she keeps that up for. My goodness. W. Decker is in the chat, and he's in the back, and he was one of the people who helped derail Dave Scott on the Space Star Radio the other day. Holy cow, that means I need to really get my act going really quick here to get to the first story and get through that. Owen from Ohio, good to see you. Who else do we have out there? I'm going to go through this as quick as I can. Syrup, good to see you, my friend. I think you're in the chat, and you're in the back. We're bringing out as well with the crew. Grandmaster UV, thank you very much. Patrick Fogarty, good to see you, and high fidelity. Yes, and super speed, too. Shelly Montgomery, good to see you. Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs. Hey, Google, what's the temperature in Florida? In Miami, it's currently, 77. currently 77 degrees with a high of 88 and a low of 69, dudes. God, best place to live, I tell you. It must be. Uh, who else do we have out there? Digger Dog is around. Good to see you, Digger Dog. Shelly Montgomery. How's Elizabeth doing? Is it? Uh, that was Jeannie. The other one was just the... Wiggle, 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 which I can never do. Not sure if anybody could out there could ever do that as well. It's fun stuff. Eli McGinnis, good to see you as well. I think we've got a super chat that I saw from Real Morning Blue. I'm going to throw up music right now and just say welcome to Real Morning Blue. Thank you very much and appreciate that super chat you threw at us today. Holy cow, what a great way to, to uh, support Disclosure tonight. Heck, it's the only way to, to support the Disclosure tonight. Remember, Every dollar that comes into Disclosure tonight goes back into our production. We are so humbled by everyone's love and support. Would you look at that? Nick from Australia is out there today, too. Holy cow. Let's take a look and cruise through this audience. Aubrey McLeod, different kind of cruising, my friends. That is not allowed on Disclosure tonight. (laughs) Rachel Smith, good to see you. Save it for Grindr. Uh, Sully's around. Jax Landry is here. You never know what can happen. Dave DeFran, good to see you, Dave. Morris is around. Good to see you, Morris. Aubrey is here. Ingrid, good to see you. Sergio, welcome, Sergio. Great to have you here. Curtis Bartel, thank you long. I am Kai. Good to see you, Kai. Do you know Kai Cho Chow as I see Cupcake uh, moving the distance? Greg O'Brien wants a cookie. i give you a cookie if I had one. Uh, Eli McGinnis, pour some for all of us. Absolutely. Where the heck am I? in the list i made it to the bottom holy cow what great timing what a great audience what great support i am so honestly welcome zach good to have you here blessed by everybody coming out today turn that music back on today in our first story of tonight um if i can really quick i've got a race through this really quick let's jump into the chat right now see who the heck we have back there first and then we've got andy w good to see you andy welcome my friend Hi, Thomas. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry to hear you ain't feeling great, mate. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Looks like Tom King kicked off. He said he wanted to do the hour from like 8 o'clock on, so I planned it. Hopefully that didn't upset him in the plans for today. I saw you took off. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for coming in. Michael, thanks for coming in, Michael. Hi. How's it going? Uh, it's been better. It's been better, I tell you. Syrup is around. Thanks for coming in, Syrup. Absolutely good to see you. Good to see everyone. Looking forward to the show. Yeah, absolutely. And Wes Decker, thank you coming. Thank you for coming in, West. Hey, my pleasure. Absolutely. Interesting day, to say the least. Now, if I jump into this, I want to jump into our first story today. Something that was on Twitter that was out there with respect to the phenomena is in our top story tonight. Let's go ahead and... Oh, it's not going to do it, is he? Let's do the... Yes, we've got a UFO news alert coming into our desks, uh, to our desk. Well, gay aliens found in UFO wreck. No, that's not the story we're going towards. Uh, we're talking about Avi Lube today. Uh, I mean, Avi Loeb, not Avi Lube. Sorry about that again, having some fun with it. Yes, you know, Professor Avi Loeb from the Galileo Project. Avi has been out there beating the war drum of his new theories about what's going on and how these UFOs really work and it's been an interesting story to say the least and is one of his latest interviews that was brought forward to us by avi m in the chat today uh my god he was on a great uh podcast today with ian i believe can't read ian's last name but i was looking at him saying you know what we need to get a closer up look on good old avi because i'm seeing some recognition wait a minute that's not avi wait that is avi wait a minute is that him no that's mr magoo but that looks close enough Back to the story about Avi Loeb in this wonderful live stream. Now, Avi is out there talking about a potential, you know, UFO mothership like Uwama Mama that flew through our 
you know, through our solar system to go ahead and drop some probes off at our planet. Well, I can tell you this is potentially how I feel about his giant flying turd, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing to show that it was intelligent. There was an acceleration on it, but nothing more. Now, not only is this giant space turd coming near our planet and flying by it, as it's going by, it's dropping off little probes that are going to come into our planet. Along that way, not only are those probes really basic for an interstellar craft, because figure the only way this could get out there would be through a propulsion-based craft that when it would hit our atmosphere, it's going to decelerate <laughs> with parachutes. A interstellar Bobby, Bobby. spaceship mothership is going to come and drop off probes that have to slow down and enter our atmosphere with parachutes. While we know Avi has, for the most part, discounted any of the sightings of the Nimitz, that everything went on interacting with our jet fighters and everything, it's all been left out. Because if those craft were to go so fast through our atmosphere, the only way we would see them is a giant ball of fire. Yeah, the Tic Tacs, because they're going so fast and moving through our atmosphere, they must go up in a giant ball of fire. Now, back to the comment about, you know, the probes that were going on. You think I'm going off on this? Oh, I'm not. <laughs> this is just the start. <laughs> My goodness, let's go ahead and crank this up a little bit. This is a little clip from, uh, oh, AVM, as I said, over in the chat. And this is a short little uh, clip here. I think it's over the 8, 10 seconds, so we may have to pause it a couple times. I want everybody to hear up front what is actually getting talked about here. Let's listen in on this. The question is... Wait, you guys in the back aren't going to be able to hear that. Hold on. I just remembered. I have to do it in Safari. Let's do it one more time. Now, everybody, including the people in the back, can go ahead and hear this, even if they could. Let's pause it again. Bring it up the volume the all is, the way. Uh, could it be? Where's the volume down so low? All right, one more time. Third time's a charm. The question is, uh, could it be that some UAP are probes of this type? And the scenario is that... So... It cannot be that the probes of this type, you know, the ones we had up there a second ago. If they come close to Earth, they might use a parachute in order to slow down in the atmosphere and not burn up like a... <laughs> oh, that's too rich. I mean, just to look on his face there as he's talking about that. I mean, maybe this is the way it is. It's this really strong, condescending kind of a tone that he talks about in all these things atmosphere and not burn up like a meteor uh and then they can pursue whatever goals whatever goals they may have <laughs> the sad part about this is that avi is getting press everywhere he is on a media tour that well would put lou elizondo's to shame he is showing up in places that well Louis hasn't even shown up in the past, and sometimes there's reason for that. But the reality is, someone like Avi, going out there, he's building this giant narrative about UFOs, about his, his motherships, to a point now he's actually going out with, you know, millions of dollars and trying to dredge the islands near Fiji. And it's an interesting thing, to say the least, my goodness, and one of those things we definitely have to, you know, cover. And I just want everybody out there to be aware of this kind of stuff. West? Uh, just two quick points besides the just ridiculousness of what he's saying. Um, you know, that rock that he's chasing that he wants to go get off the bottom of the ocean. I hate to tell him, but he calculated the speed that came into the atmosphere. It didn't have a parachute. And uh, number two, maybe he should go watch some uh, SpaceX uh, launches and watch how SpaceX brings its rockets back, back down. Other than the crew capsule, they don't use uh, parachutes either. They happen no. to be able to land them. Right. Right. Exactly. So it's even going and applying 
the modern innovations that we've earned in the last 10 years, at least coming from SpaceX. And it's uh, just from the area of, of us trying to explore UFOs and bring out the truth. When you have someone who's getting such a loud voice and that voice is getting combined up with, um, what do you call it? Getting combined up with uh, Sean Kirkpatrick, who's the head of ARO. It's a really concerning conversation that, you know, people need to start bringing this to forward and understand who the heck Avi is. And some people need to be in consideration. Do I really want to get the, hey, look at this. I can bring him on, on my show and all the views I can get, all the clicks I can get. Sometimes it's not about the views and the clicks. It's about what is trying to be brought out is the problem. On that note, um, let's see. I believe we've got Mr. Dave Scott. Actually, before you bring you on, Dave, uh, West, we were hanging out Friday, and then you jumped over to Spaced Out Radio, and there was a really great guest over there. Do you want to fill us in and kind of what, what you set off in the second hour of that show? Well, I don't... <laughs> Well, I will just say, as always, Dave has awesome guests and um, does a great job with his interviews. And I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, apologize to Dave, actually, because I think I derailed his guest uh, at the uh, turn of the hour, because at one point, um, Rich Hoffman was on there and he seemed to have some strong feelings about what uh, is going on in our community. And I don't blame him for that. But at one point, Dave asked him a question about transparency, and what set me off was his attitude that um, came across to me, at least, like he just didn't give a shit what we th think we want to know or what we might, um, you know, access to the data, things like that. It was basically get out of my way or get out of our way and let us figure things out, and we'll tell you what we want to tell you when we're good and ready. Yeah. I'm sure I'm adding more to that than he said, but yeah. it it set me off and it set me off primarily because um, I get it. The Twitter UFO Twitter, especially can be a toxic place and all of us are armchair quarterbacks. So I get all that. But part of the reason that we're all sitting around armchair quarterbacking is because we don't have any real data. We don't get good information. We're left to kind of scrounge for it. And when I hear people who have, a voice in this community and who are trying to do really good work express the opinion that we're the problem i just it, it, it rubs me the wrong way and especially in the case of what he was talking about because at least here in the united states the majority of grants that go to um scientists and uh the government uh as a whole are paid for by us as american taxpayers and that's true i'm sure in other countries as well and so I feel like I just felt like I needed to say something on behalf of uh, those of us who are asking for transparency yeah. and just say, hey, can you at least give us some respect and not belittle us? And that was my point. Yeah. And I, again, I apologize to Dave because I didn't mean to throw his. Oh, no, it off. sounds like something he's really proud of. And that's why he's actually here to talk about it. Mr. Dave, how you doing? Oop, you're on mute, Dave. You're right. Yeah. It's the, uh, there we go. There Sorry you. about that. No, I'm an amateur at this. I'm an amateur at this. I don't get to do this often. Yeah. Good to have you here, buddy. Yeah. I appreciate that. And you know, uh, uh West, uh, you didn't uh, knock me off my pedestal or, uh, rouse me at anything. I was heading in that direction at, at the same time you were going, because uh, obviously you and I were picking up the exact same thing when rich hoffman was basically saying you know experiencers and and those who were in the know get out of our way it's time to it's time for the pros to do their job you know we're not fighting a fire here we're not you know trying to calm down a a a mob of people like you would hope the police would do i mean this is ufos i mean there are people here that are trying to deal with some honest problems OK, us experiencers did not ask. There's not one single experiencer that did not ask for their experience to be taken from their bed or taken from their car or taken while out on a jog or, or anything. Not one. 
okay, and to dismiss it and say, you guys go over there, that's where you need to be while we scientists do the work. I'm sorry, Thomas, I'm, I'm going to swear here, but that's bullshit. Yeah. It, it, it's bullshit. Okay. And I talked to Tim Senor. We were talking about it a little bit earlier tonight because the one thing that I have learned through this weekend, and now that show is three days ago, and I'm still fired up about it. Okay. And the one thing that I, I asked him earlier today when we were talking, and Tim, by the way, I apologize, I fell asleep after dinner. So that's why I didn't call you back. But um, the one reason, one of the questions I brought up now, and, and Tim had a good answer, is this. I asked Tim point blank, with all the scientists that are now tied into the government and tied into the military, that includes MUFON, that includes Galileo, the SCU, Enigma Labs, Ryan Graves' new group, and UAPX, if you want to even call them anything, okay, any of those groups that are said to be looking into this situation, why are we going to give them any time? And should we give them any airtime, knowing now that they are all on the same page? They don't care about people. They're only interested in scientific results, whereas any experiencer will tell you, true experiencer will tell you, the answers are not in nuts and bolts. It goes beyond that. Consciousness, my friend. Consciousness is a huge one, part, a big part of it, Thomas. Right. You're absolutely right. So the question is, do we or should we, as serious hosts of these shows, whether you're a radio show like I am, a podcast or a YouTube channel, should we be giving them the airtime to say, you're not good enough. Your story means nothing. Your story's anecdotal. Well, guess what? David Fravers is anecdotal. He's just saying what he saw. No, well, no, is he did he actually see something or is he reporting on what other people saw well, on their but, council? But so the, he's like a secondhand. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it, it just, honestly, it rattled me, Thomas, you know, and, and that's why I kind of went at uh, Rich Hoffman a little bit, very politely, because I th I'm not one of these ha, 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 gotcha kind of guys that we, that a lot of podcasters think they need to be. You can ask hard questions or strong questions with being polite, which is what I tried to do. And when he told me that transparency for the public right now means nothing, that didn't fly well with me. It's like and it shouldn't fly well with ufology. Oh, hell no, because it's like saying we're getting the access to the data that we want. And you know what? We're going to be like the government. We're going to share it because you don't deserve to know. You don't have a right to know. And we're not going to tell you. Absolutely. Well, what was even worse? Oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Go ahead. Please go ahead, Wes. No, I was just going to say one of the things that impressed me about the way you were questioning him was that you were being really polite. And he was getting noticeably agitated which always is a sign that something's off with somebody if they're it means they've got i don't know it reminds me of the archaeologists uh in egypt when they start uh hearing people debate the age of the sphinx and they go just apoplectic um that's kind of what was happening with him but the thing that really triggered me with your transparency question is that you were asking why should we who you're asking for our data, why should we share that data with you if we're not going to get anything back? And that's when he went off and said, you know, basically we don't matter and we should just, you know, basically take it up the, excuse me, you know what I mean? But it just felt so out of touch with humanity to me. And I was, I was like I said, it, it, it angered me so much that I ended up sending like, sending that uh super chat or whatever because i couldn't believe what i was hearing from him and but I'm, Wes, I'm like can, you, I, can i cut in here for a quick second please please i think you were feeling like you caught exactly what i caught which is exactly what tim senor caught thomas you caught it too and a lot of people caught that clip and were just like oh my god i can't believe that as an experiencer or as someone who has interest that my opinion means nothing in this field. 
the scarier part for this, and once again, uh, I've been bouncing a lot off of Tim Senor on this recently, is, is this. Hoffman admitted they are all tied together. Okay, I'll go through the groups again. Enigma Labs, MUFON, UAPX, Galileo, Ryan Graves' new group, and a bunch of others that we, we may not be familiar with. They are all tied together. It doesn't matter that they're working on separate projects, okay? But they are all moving in the same direction, conversing with one uh, one or another, okay? And we, as the, the mainstream of ufology, are being cut out of the loop. And it's not just people like Thomas or myself or any other show out there. Think about it. People who've been studying this subject for 40, 50 years, Grant Cameron, Richard Dolan, Peter Robbins, Melinda Leslie, Lorian Fenton, Misha Johnson, okay, just to name a few who've been doing this forever are cut out as well. They haven't been asked to join in. They're actually been shunned from this entire project. And those are the people for years years, decades, who were our voice for us to know that we were not crazy with what we saw or what we experienced. And now for the science community to come in and bully us off of our own experiences, saying we're not good enough, our voices don't deserve to be heard. Now, a lot of people will say, Dave, you're being melodramatic right now. Maybe I am a little bit. Okay, no, but it, that's no, you, you, literally you, you, what what Rich Hoffman told us. You, now you, we need more people, obviously, to confirm the feelings of Mr. Hoffman. This isn't just on him, and then we wrap it all up in one present. No, I mean, what does this say about somebody like Gary Nolan, who's an experiencer as well? He's been taken by aliens. It's it's a coalition Allegedly. of indep of in organizations who have come together to act as another tier of disclosure meaning that we're going to go ahead and either get access to stuff or we're going to go find stuff. But it's, again, then we're better than you. You don't need to know about this. We don't want to hear your feedback on it because all you're going to do is get in the way of our science, which is just, you know, reminds me uh, as of the ego of Avi Loeb in the same kind of a manner where it's the, well, you're going to give it to us, we're going to take it, and there's nothing in return. It just doesn't make sense. It just... You know, it, it should come in as people who are thinking about donating or being a part of these organizations, knowing what the empty halls are going to be like when you go there to find something out other than some light PR. Well, the other thing, though, OK, if you go look at UFO Twitter right now, there is a big battle right now between the left and the right on politics. And the right is calling out the left. The left is calling out the right. We have people on the left saying if if uh, UFOs are woke and it's a woke topic, and if you aren't uh, it's not. part of that system, we're blocking you. You're just a racist and all this kind of stuff. We are seeing this on UFO Twitter right now. You know, I brought that up to some people whose names I'm not going to mention. And I said, hey, I like to follow you on UFO Twitter. But when you bring politics in it, it may, you know, it just pushes it away. And I got freaking stomped down. Absolutely. And Everybody's it's like, well, I'm going to talk about right this. Now. This is what I'm here. You're here to follow me. And if you don't want to hear it, then just unfollow me. So the only thing I can do now is when I see the the leftist ludicrousies coming out there, I'm going to go ahead and just call it out for what it is and, and put my opinion on top of it, whether it goes for it or not. It's just that either that or you just have to start taking more and more people and just blocking them off of UFO Twitter, no matter what well, contributions they could have made on a submarine. Twitter, you know what? Twitter, UFO Twitter, first off and foremost, is a cesspool. And you really <laughs> have to deal through a lot of slime and grime before you get to the actual right. news of what there is. And I don't know if maybe it's because I'm Canadian and I don't know the American side of things, but the last time I checked, the Greys were not Republican or Democrat. And they're not American. They're not Chinese. They're not Russian. They're not South African. Absolutely. They're not Brazilian. They're, they are whatever they are. It's, it's a humanity issue. 
It's not a U.S. issue. It's something that goes worldwide Bingo. for all of us. Bingo. And you know what? When I look at the way UFO Twitter is acting right now, I can look at Rich Hoffman and I can say, you know what? You're right. Look at the way we're acting. Okay? Because the unfortunate part of what we do is we get blamed for everything. Okay? We, we all get grouped in. Whether it's Elizondo doing it or Cahill doing it or Hoffman doing it or Jay Stratton, we all get grouped in. They lump us in like coal. And we're not coal. There are a number of us who are trying to do really good unbiased work. Whether it's a little bit more on the fringe side like I am where I like the woo and I like to bring that or whether it's a news side like somebody like Thomas who brings in a lot of hardcore UFO news. Okay. We need channels of a great, of a great difference in order to get the headlines out there. It doesn't matter whether you like or not uh, Rich Giordano, or you like or not Steve Cambion, or you like or not the black vault, or you like or not exo Academian, or, or myself or Jimmy church or coast to coast. Hey, black vault. I heard they have a really great sex toy so store on eBay. <laughs> Well, you might want to Not test promoted. that out. I don't know. Maybe that's your thing. I now. wonder if they've got the alien probe. We need to check. Never that, know. That would be but such... The po- but the point that I'm getting at is we are losing the, the message because of stupid infighting. Okay? Stupid infighting about Elizondo. Stupid infighting about, about whether you're on the left or on the right. Stupid infighting about your education background. You're not apparently, uh, you know, what kind of questions are we supposed to ask if you're not giving us answers? Well, I mean, we turn to the we turn to the experience. I mean, even when we had the issue where Lou Elizondo, uh, where Cahill came out and put out the video that was shot from the inside Elizondo's house, you could see the reflections of the of the mirrors through of the of the glass through the freaking uh, camera when it was done. That's fine. You could go ahead and talk about it. And people said, oh, my God, you can't go ahead and talk about this. Lou's on the ISIS list. We'll tell you what they already know about the different parts, what are there, and that's fine. But the thing is, if you don't want people to talk about it, stop talking about it. Stop going out there in the great carrying to go ahead and read everybody the riot act. If you don't like it, freaking move on and look at something else. You don't have to be there to uh, to be poisonous. I've said for the longest time, uh, uh, taking the, the quote from Thumper, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say nothing. Absolutely. And, you know, I was thinking about, you know, like uh, I'm going to be doing I'm, I'm leaving for San Francisco for UFO con on Thursday. Uh, and I was thinking on Wednesday night, maybe I'll do my Dave 101. And I was really thinking about doing it on the entire left versus right, telling both sides to give their head a shake. But as a show like mine, now I have to worry about what are the repercussions of of saying something like that because somebody is going to fly off the hill on one side or the other saying I'm, I'm either this or I'm that. Well, here's the old thing. If you may, if you, if you make fun of the guy who has memory problems, you got to bring up the guy with the orange face. You have to play his neutral and hit at both sides of the fence. Kind of like what Bill Maher does sometimes. That that's kind of, but it, to me, it has nothing to do with, with the dude with the bad hair, or the guy with no hair. Yeah. Okay. It makes no, no difference to me because I got to deal with the idiot who's up here in Ottawa. Okay. I got my <laughs> own problems right now. Right. But none, none of oh. the, yeah, my guy at least is uh, admits to be bought by China. Right. But that's yeah. a different conversation whatsoever. Yeah. Right. But the yeah. point that I'm getting at is, where does this politics come from? We are be if if ufology would actually sit back and realize that we are being screwed by the scientific and government community on this subject, that's not left, that's not right. Okay, this is a full screwing right down the middle. All right. They don't care if you are a Biden wokeologist. They don't care if if you are a a Republican who who uh, you know uses the term America. Okay, they don't care. They only care about the data for themselves. This is why Enigma has come out of nowhere and is all of a sudden taking over. They got five to seven million dollars 
to play with from a multi-billionaire named Peter Thiel, as everybody knows, okay, and they are going to use it. And they are going to use it to shut this information down. And the worst part about it is, people, the worst part about it is where do they get their information from? Us. From slugs like each and every one of us who think, oh, well, I got to report it somewhere. I got to do something. And if Enigma is hitting every database the way they are, I mean, if this group just fully started getting into investigation two months ago, three months ago, how the hell do they have over 300,000 reports when they don't even have somebody taking the reports online yet? Because they're siphoning the data from other sources in, in, in building a, a knowledge set and a data set to go ahead and work from. They are taking from MUFON. They are taking from any UFO group that will give them their data, along with the government, along with NASA, along with Arrow. They're the player. And they're going to stay secret because they are allowed to stay secret because they are private and they don't have to tell you a thing. They don't have to tell you who's investigating. They never have to get back to you. All they want is your personal information. Well, MUFON ta takes all their internal data and all their different methods for putting together reports. And all, none of that, they don't want released to anybody. That's all their work product that they don't want anybody to see. Absolutely. What's up with that? It's the same thing. It is the I, same um, thing. But at least with MUFON, they are a public organization where you know who's investigating you. If Joe Smith from central Wisconsin calls you up and says, hey, I heard you heard of al saw aliens eating a bunch of cheese. OK, you know that person. You build that relationship with Joe Smith, the MUFON investigator. With Enigma, they're not telling you who's involved. OK, why are they why is Enigma trying to cut all of these private backdoor deals with ufologists out there? I've heard some big names that they have been trying to get. I heard people like David Marler have turned them down and his and his uh, assets and, and uh, recordings down. I've heard a lot of people are buying into it. OK, why are they doing this secretly? OK, I can tell it's, you if you'd like. <laughs> oh, please go ahead. No, I, first of all, I think, Dave, you're on fire. You, you're hitting all the hot buttons. I won't um, say too much, but I just want to say I'm, I've am i done the Silicon Valley thing. I've done the um, venture capital thing. And if people don't understand the threat level of what Dave is describing, let me give you a really good example from this weekend. Um, that guy, Peter Thiel, who uh, is backing Enigma, um, he single-handedly caused the run on SVB Bank that caused that to fail this weekend. And then he and his cronies all started using Twitter to basically tank another bank and then start panicking the entire system. Well, so we've got, afraid... if I can say this really quick, just to comment on this, yeah. it went from one to now potentially three, and there's maybe more things that are coming out of it. It took less than a day for the Biden administration to make a comment about the banking industry and what they're going to do. And it took them eight days to comment anything about the foreign craft we had in our, in our airspace. Exactly. But my point is, is the reason that these guys did this is because their money was tied up in SVB and they wanted their money back. So they basically threatened to burn the whole system down unless the government stepped in and fixed it for a Monday morning, which they did. So that's the kind of people who are playing with our data. And the reason they want our data, it's because that is the only way you can train an artificial intelligence system. Neural networks, these machine learning algorithms require tons of data. And so all these backroom deals they're doing are to join those, join up as much data as they can to build a set data set that they can train an AI on. And it's not our data. Peter Thiel has several other companies that specialize in data, basically data aggregation and facial recognition. I'm certain that what he's doing is he's building this as a tool to resell back to the government as an uh, asset for them to use. But I wanted to mention one other point, just because Dave, you said something really key, I thought at the beginning of this, which is these people are coming on your platform on, uh, Fessler's platform, they're asking for airtime, and then they're asking for us, the public, to either give them our data or to give them 
uh, our support by making noise and calling our congressmen. They use us all the time. Absolutely. And so you asked the question at the beginning, which is, should we be giving these people time on our platforms? I think that's the right question because right now they're using the shit out of all of us and we're not getting anything back from them, I feel. And I think that's a really important question. I just wanted to bring that back up. Well, what do we need more grainy videos? No. Do we need more? Do we need more? Uh, Jeremy Corbell type videos out there. No, no offense to Jeremy. Okay. But do we need more Boca type videos? And, and here's the thing. Need, Jeremy brings out the videos. He doesn't Zondos? even have. Do we need more Lou Elizondo's telling us that, that uh, there's 23 minute videos out there, but guess what people you're never going to see them. Do we need that? You know what? You ask any experiencer out there, Thomas, I know you're a multiple experiencer like I am. Many of your audience is too. What's the one question all of us experiencers have in common? Why me? Why me? And you know what? That's too hard of a question for them to answer because they don't want to delve into that because they still think we're nut bars. Okay. I want to know why this changed my entire life. I had a happily boring life. I had lots of good friends who are no longer my friends because I went down this rabbit hole. Many other people are like that as well. This has affected them. It's, in both it's what, it's what went ways. on, but it's the lies, the misinformation, the disinformation that's been put out there that Yes. Raises the skepticism, which basically makes us get sound like, you know, get out your tinfoil hats and fru uh, fruits and nuts. And, you know, we're going to go ahead and tell you a tale. But the reality is, is the truth that could potentially be out there to help deal with some of the stuff that a lot of people have gone through is all kept behind that curtain. And more importantly, the curtain of lies and, and, and deceit. hundred percent, dude. hundred percent. And, you know, these are good people who've experienced this, and I, and I apologize. I, I'm not trying to get emotional and upset here, okay? But the people I have talked to who have gone through, some of them nightmares, some of them uh, potentially wanting to commit suicide over this because they can't handle it. Where's the government study on those? No, you're right, Thomas, because those people are considered crazy. Those people are considered lunatic. You know what? They're scared. They're not, they're not dumb. They're not insane. They're scared. Right. And what's gone on is a lot of the environment, the atmosphere that's been put out there, the stories that have been thrown out there by people where it didn't happen, it dilutes the stuff where people where it actually did happen. And because there's such a dilution, you don't know what is real and what is not which opens the door for a lot of people who may have had something happen or a lot of people who didn't have something happen to race in the door and ra ra uh, wave the flag as well. So it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I had something happen to me, but I am just so, uh, I wouldn't call myself skeptical. I have a high level of bar to cross to say, okay, that's where you're at. Just because I went through so much and I want, and I try to relate to other people based on the stuff that I've went through. And it's not sometimes a basis thing, but sometimes that's all we have. Yes, absolutely. And you know what? If that's all we have is anecdotal stories, which the majority, I would say 95% have, why does Enigma and all of these groups want our stories if there's no proof? It certainly it, seems like that data is a lot more valuable than they let on, huh? Absolutely. It, you know, what about... You, I mean, everybody lo loves to bitch at Grant Cameron for going down all of these really weird, uh, uh, you know, paths towards it, whether it's people get getting downloads of binary codes, whether it's people who claim to have flown the ship, okay? Those people have had something immaculate happen, immaculate. What could the government do with people who wrote, actually wrote down the binary codes that they were downloaded? What about that? What does that lead to? I'm not a binary code kind of guy. To me, it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. Makes no sense. But guess what? There's somebody on this planet, maybe even Wes Decker, 
knows what that means. Well, dep- d- depends on what the binary <laughs> is. It depends on what the binary is a representation of. Is it a res- re- representation of a character set or something else or some kind of data set? Yeah. It's being able to take those large n- n- groups of ones and zeros and turn them into something more meaningful. But it's just just a yet another form of method that people are getting some of the stuff dropped into their minds. Well, let me yeah. say one quick thing, too, just to add on to what you're saying there, Dave. Um, when companies get venture backing like Enigma Labs did, they only get it because they have a money-making strategy in mind. That means they're taking in this data of ours to sell. There is a profit in it for them. And that's something we should all keep in mind. This, They're a for-profit company, and they're using our data in some way to make money. And Absolutely. And we shouldn't be uh, so eager to just roll over, let them take it, and then not expect anything in return. I think that is a very smart and astute comment. Very smart and astute comment. And that is something that we need to uh, seriously give credit to. I have started telling my audience, maybe West and Thomas, I know you and I share a number of audience members on YouTube. I have actually been telling my audience recently, don't submit your information to anybody. Hold on to it. You know, maybe go in a Facebook group. Maybe contact a Thomas or 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 a Grant Cameron or somebody privately saying, I don't know who else to turn this to. Can you help me? There are more people out there who don't want your address. They don't want your, your email. They don't want your phone number. They just want your story. They may want to ask you some pertinent questions afterwards. You have a choice. They don't want to know what you do for work. They don't want to know uh, how much your car is, you know, or how long is your commute. They don't want to know that that personal information. How many family members are in your household? They just want to hear the story and work off the story. You know, it's it's much like when I found out the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were sending people's information to NORAD. I couldn't figure out why Canadian people. And experiencers were having my lab, MK Ultra, and Alphabet agencies contacting them. Couldn't figure out why, because Canada doesn't have the budget for it. And yet, when I found out that the RCMP was actually sending the report with all of the personal information from the person who reported it to NORAD, it all of a sudden made sense. So the point that I'm getting at is when you fill out one of those reports, they're asking you very personal details, your date of birth. Where were you? What were you wearing? They want you to know about everything. Who else was with you? you? Who else saw this besides you? Absolutely. Can we get their information on it so we could corroborate the story? Oh, yeah. They're very good at at deciphering all of this. And what do you do? You're all excited. Hey, somebody is interested in my UFO sighting. Yeah, my buddy Dale here was was right with me when it happened. Yeah, I'll give you his phone number. Oh, by the way, Dale's 36 years old. He's a father of two. His wife's name is Nancy, and he works construction at the local at the local, uh, you know, for the local town. Or he's an air traffic controller, a pilot, or whatever else they say. It just comes down to they really, and, and that is one of the required fields they have to fill out. What is your occupation? Yes. Yeah. One um, other thing that came up here in the chat that I just wanted to highlight. Um, when we were talking about Peter Th- uh, Thiel a minute ago, um, someone rightfully pointed out, we've been hearing a lot from Eric Weinstein recently. He did that big Joe Rogan podcast. He seems like he's like somebody good on our side trying to get to the truth. Be aware that he is the fund manager for Peter Thiel. He's the mathematical genius that makes Peter all of his money. So keep that in mind when you start. I'm not one to like push conspiracy where I don't think conspiracy exists, but here I'm afraid it's not conspiracy. Yeah. It's it's literally lines of, um, you know, follow the money. The money is linking all of these people real tightly together. So we need to be, again, cautious and realize they see our money, our, they see us as being valuable. They see value in our data. So once again, we should all start to consider, just like Dave is saying, pull back. Don't share your data because that's our leverage. 
and we shouldn't give it away. We should make them earn it. Right. Absolutely. Especially MUFON. MUFON has had some very questionable, sketchy people up at the top involved in some sketchy things. They've sold all their all of their data in the past to Robert Bigelow. And uh, there used to be some great people involved on the board who are no longer there. It's just an organization you really have to be careful about. Just, you know, don't think it's this great UFO or organization in the sky that's going to come save the day or represent uh, represent you and give you the answers they want. They uh, you want. They're going to give you the answers that they want you to have, not what you deserve. That's a strong comment, Thomas. A very strong comment. Yeah. And uh, you know we we are being sucked into a game. And what's what's the best way to keep the public on edge? Bring in politics, which is what we are seeing. On UFO Twitter right now, a lot of left versus right over the last month and people falling for it. This isn't just the pro Elizondo versus the anti Elizondo crowd anymore. This is Biden ver people versus the rest of the people. And look, I'm, I don't care. I don't care who it is because it's not my country. Okay, but I can tell you this, when you start the political divide and you are and you have some people on Twitter who are now saying that if you're not woke, you can't be in ufology because ufology is a woke topic or you have people it's saying. It's not woke, for Christ's yeah. sake. I mean, it's true. that reminds me of there was, God, if I can find his name, there is a guy I follow. He's a researcher. From Australia. Granted, we know there's a lot of them. And one of the things he brought out and he said over the weekend was that uh, regarding all the stuff that's going on with ufology and everything right now, I don't trust any of the politicians from the U.S. who are talking on it because they're all crooked. <laughs> so even from other countries, they're looking at what's going on in the U.S., seeing the fight going between both sides. And they're even saying, well, what the hell is this? I'm just going to call them all out for what they are. I think Sergio well, we said it best in the chat real quick. Uh, he said, it's like ancient Rome. Let's go, people. We have gladiators killing each other tonight for your entertainment. That's, I think, a lot of what this feels like to me is they are just doing everything they can to keep us off balance so we don't notice what's going on another great comment thomas i i hate to run here that's fine quickly, i was planning on having you on for uh, the for, for the first hour that's why i rushed uh from the show to get things started so i could get you in here get you uh, get this conversation done because i know you've got a show to get ready for that starts up in an hour yeah thank you so much and and uh disclosure tonight thank you to your audience and every member of this panel tonight you guys are phenomenal and uh thomas keep up the great work and and you know what one thing that I like about Thomas and, and many others is we're as, as the UFO public, we're starting to see the light. Yeah. Give us time because we, we want to make sure that whatever we're bringing, we're bringing the truth. And, and we're not going to eat a bullshit sandwich. And if we see one, we're going to tell you don't eat it. Cause no matter how much butter you put on it, as Lee Iacocca said, it's still going to taste like shit. Let me say one thing before you leave, Dave, I just want to point out that if people lose hope by what you know reading ufo twitter they should be able to quickly see by joining your show and our show and looking at the chats because the people that we have in our chats are the exact opposite of ufo twitter these i've never seen a better group of people who like to pull together support each other and it's inspiring to me every time i get to see what's going on in our chats so I think uh, we're a good antidote, or I shouldn't say we, Thomas, this is Thomas's show. Thomas is a great antidote, and your show is an amazing antidote to yeah. UFO Twitter. So Our chat room is just a little bit more lax. <laughs> Th thank you, guys. You guys are amazing. Yeah. Keep up the great work, Thomas. Catch you on the flip side, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Take care, Dave. Great conversation. Uh was something I'd planned to cover in the first part of the show before Tom King showed up. Hopefully Tom's coming back today to talk about the uh, uh, historic date it is with the, uh, what do you call it, um, Phoenix Lights coming around again. It was one of those days you get hit one from one thing to the left, one thing to the right, and your stomach and your shit decides to go out in a different direction, have it and have a mind of its own. 
I'm still freaking shaky from the situation right now. So it's just been one of those days, to say the least. Let's see. Uh, well, your thought on the conversation. Let's go around the room, West. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, having having the conversation. And thanks for Dave for coming on. I thought it was um, right on point. And from a standpoint of the thing that uh, bugged me that night, and I'm glad it bugged Dave too, is just there was a kind of arrogance and a kind of um, belittling that I, I felt like Rich Hoffman <laughs> kept letting his inside, you know, he kept saying the things that you're not supposed to say. Yeah. Um, he was letting his true colors shine. And it was, it was really yeah. um, embarrassing for him, yeah. I thought. And we should all strive to do a whole lot better than the, what he was talking about, because yeah. this community is not as toxic and not as bad as no. UFO Twitter look, it looks like. And we should never fall into the trap of just lumping us all into one group and dismissing uh, people like they were trying to do. Or and what we do. do here, I'll bring it up again. Just as we start off the show, sometimes you have to take everything with a grain of salt, talking about the Galeans. <laughs> no, we're talking about Avi Loeb. I mean, no, not Avi Loeb. Who put that in there? You know, Avi Loeb, you know, Galileo Project. Wait a minute. Let's take a close up. Oh, yeah. You know, you need to look at some of these people who are saying this stuff about ufology and everything else. Have a field day with it. If he's talking about Umama Mama, that giant thing that looks like a flying space turd, call it out for what it is. And he's saying it's flying by our planet, leaving probes. Well, there you go. And why? Because it's got parachutes on it. You know, take the story that goes along with it and let it be told. Have a fun time about it, but just don't forget it. Exactly. Yes. I had to go through that again. Andy, my friend, your thoughts. On the, uh, we deserve the UF, to know the UFO truth. Well, we do, don't we? You know, um, I, I can't say I'm, a, I'm an experiencer of abductions or anything. You know, I've, I've had sightings of things I can't explain in the sky and, and in my general vicinity. But um, very, very interesting. Um, it was great to have Dave on. Unfortunately, I don't ever get a catch his show because it's, Right at the end of yours, and it's middle of the night. Um, I think really uh, big, big thumbs up to West. Um, very, very insightful. Um, uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to find, think of the right words, but yeah, um, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to catch up with the show to just see what's going on. But hundred percent right. I I look at uh, UFO Twitter, and it's it's a cesspit half the time um there's some information in there but yeah you got to wade through all that crap yeah um yeah yeah great to have dave on though um very very insightful and uh, yeah. informative is because of, is it is coming in from the over the air and i didn't i didn't get to let the last one if you're gonna be hanging out with avi lube just beware of falling poop <laughs> i've got to say i i I just don't jive with Avi Lube. I, I really, really yeah. don't. Um, you know? Lube. I said Lube, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Rich, Rich would, uh, oh, God, he had so many different names for people throughout the years. It just, just kind of, it just, I'm not sure where we got Avi Lube from. Someone brought it up in the chat or someone in the back said it. That may have actually been from me. And then I, I went and I, and, and then I went from there and I created the, I took, it was an Avis Lube. <laughs> I was going through something, UFOs alert. It was Avis Lube. And I turned that, got got rid of the S, picked up the sign, and moved it over to the right and turned it into Avi Lube. It was perfect. When you have to drive three and a half hours to go ahead and, and uh, uh, if you want to call it, strategize on misinformation and disinformation, don't forget about taking care of your car with Avi Lube, yes. It's, it's um, yeah, just the, the fact that it was, who was it who, who went and knocked on his door after the, uh, the, um, the three-hour drive? Three and a half hour drives from Sean yeah, Kirkpatrick, which Kirk I will Patrick, always Kirk be Patrick. in debt to uh, Senator Gillibrand, who repeatedly called him uh, Fitzpatrick. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just see it as a massive cabal. Yeah, basically, the, every single one of them seems to be all coming, meshing together and, and trying to sell this this um, 
a way of thinking that is, yeah. is totally against our everybody who's yeah. in our chat in Dave Scott's show. Everybody. Yeah, Sergio Casa says, if you drink blue Corazon bottle, you can poop and piss blue. Truth of the matter is, if you need and eat enough blueberries, it'll do the same thing just for one, not the other. <laughs> Great conversation. Uh, who else do we have in the back with their hands up who hung out? Uh, actually, talking surface monkey, my friend, you've had your head up for a while, your hand up for a while. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, I just want to say, I think, um, you know, there's obviously still people you know, within um, the government or whatever, who don't want this information out there. So I think they're utilizing um, the, uh, the CAA playbook where, you know, you infiltrate an organization from the inside and you, you play this game of stupidity and you, you send the people in the organization, you know, down rabbit holes and you keep them on uh, spinning on a, a hamster wheel. But, uh, you know, I, I did add the link to their to the CIA um, field manual on basically how to subvert an organization. Mm -hmm. I think, you know that there's a lot of people that that you guys are mentioning that that's their purpose. Uh, you know, they, there's certain information that they do not want um, to get out, so they're employing these techniques. That's how I see it. And and you know, my um, suggestion would be to just ignore them. Like, you know, we spent all this time now talking about these basically these morons instead of um you know put, uh, get, getting more information out there so they in a sense have accomplished the task of just you know keeping us on a on a hamster wheel talking about them as opposed to um uh providing you know more information and, and moving this uh this subject forward so that's what i got to say about that no, I think that's a, a that's a good point. I feel like um, it's important to call it out, like we did tonight, though, because uh, it it's easy to um, get, like you said, the hamster wheel. I think a lot of times they dangle cheese in front of us and get us excited, and then we kind of forget. Oh, wait a minute! Why are you? Why am I dancing to your tune? Yeah, it's so. better be working with a hamster wheel than with a hamster tube west. <laughs> With that, I think I'll pass it off to our next guest. <laughs> <laughs> Who else do we have in the back? Let's see. I think, Michael, any thoughts on the conversation with Dave? Let's get the round robin going here. I think you're all right. You know, like, um, oh. uh, there's a movie coming out called Accidental Truth, that yeah. UFO movie I was telling you about. And uh, I think we're going to see something uh, hopefully new out yeah. of that movie. They're going to push the envelope. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I've got to double check into that movie link you gave the other day and get out there and double check it and everything. Um, let me go ahead and get this up here. There's uh, an interesting thing about that movie, too, is that it's not well known right now because it's coming out in April. Gotcha. The way I found it was I went to Associated Press and searched their UFO stories. And I don't know, Associated Press, of course, is a nonprofit organization that spews out all kinds of stories for most of the news outlets so if you want to get a heads up on something like that you can go search associated press gotcha a a ap is an interesting organization to, to say the least i've got um oh god hey thomas just in case you didn't notice but uh tom is back here with us now. Uh, that's what i was just about to jump into <clears throat> as uh tom king are you there my friend I think you're there. All right. Does he get that put together and everything? I have got an interesting story here. Would you believe it now? It was 26 years later. The Phoenix Lights remain one of America's biggest UFO events. Turning back the clocks on March 13th, 1997, almost all of Phoenix saw a wide V of lights in the city, in the sky above the city. It's one of the biggest UFO sightings in the world and to go ahead and bring out i think i've got a re an artistic rendering of the object in the 3d scene going ahead and just flying over if you want to call it uh let's go ahead and uh, where is that at um bring this up here over phoenix if you see the city of phoenix below it gives you just an idea of the scope and scale 
of just how oh, big cool. the Phoenix Lights was when it actually came over the city of Phoenix back at that time. If I continue on here, where was I? Um, uh, the event started in Nevada when a Henderson resident reportedly saw a V-shaped object with six lights on its leading edge pass overhead, flying southeast towards Arizona. Over the next few hours, hundreds of people called in to the National UFO Reporting Center to describe the lights as they passed overhead. One of the people who's in our chat right now, Tom King, uh, is uh, one of the people who was actually there, witnessed it, and actually got his video camera out to go ahead and grab video footage of this monumental event. Um, I've got an... um, So, uh, Fife Simington, who was an Arizona governor at the time, revealed in 2007, he witnessed one of the UFOs during the 97 event, Now, while Symington said in an episode of UFO Hunters, the U.S. military would not give him information on the bizarre lights. Remember, this is the Joker who came out with the uh, taking a UFO. They thought they were going to have a press conference on it. He walked out someone who was an alien wearing a a plastic hat and everything, and everybody laughed, and they played this off like a joke. So in the years since, the Office of Director of National Intelligence released a report on the government's findings on UAP, better known as unidentified flying objects. Unfortunately, the nine-page reports, the reports they put out to date, have not mentioned anything about the Phoenix Lights yet. Um, Now, I do have a news clip going back from that time. Uh, We can watch that, Tom. Or Are you there, Tom? Yeah. Hey, what are you guys up to? Oh, well, I was just giving an intro and a rundown on the Phoenix Lights and the event that happened. I know you were one of the guys that was there. I know we're talking about a bigger thing to go through on a on a scene-by-scene event. I've been sick as a dog today, so I'm prepared as much as shit. So I'm just trying to get stuff together and uh, talk with everybody about this day that you were a part of and actually helped record history. Yeah, some of that was accurate. I think the UFO Reporting Center got about 50 calls at night, but they continued to pour in for weeks, months, and years um, after the fact. The object was actually seen the night before um, leaving Las Vegas. Uh, There were two of these objects. Uh, They were seen basically as the sun went down, they were heading south. It happened again the next night. And then there was a report where it was seen from Henderson. Some of these reports came in much after the fact, and then we can piece a lot of these uh, dots together. Right. Y'all are some, most, there's a lot of people here, are sadiomasochistic. Uh, you, you waste a lot of fucking time on Twitter, uh, which ain't real. And then it's a call out. And it's like, you're cutting yourself and you follow you. Like, and then you, you go back and do it again. I mean, you can find nuggets of gold digging around in the sewage of a shit house, but I ain't gonna do it. Yeah. But to do that night after night, I don't get why you guys do that. I'm outside with binoculars, just recording everything. Now, this hey, is one of your videos called the Phoenix running. Lights Full Video Rare. Do you want to explain what we're seeing here? Is this kind of going on? Yeah, you probably want to. The full one's like ten minutes long, so you probably this one's nine minutes and thirty nine seconds. Is that it? Yeah that that was um. It's funny, this video has been seen by so many people, and yet I see people on social media say, well, they drop flares in response to cover this up. This media, or this video here started at 940, okay? The the, the big chain of the lights, the, the nine of them, came at 10 o'clock, 20 minutes later. This is the fifth time these orange lights showed up and were filmed from this location I was at. This is the fourth night that week it happened. So, no, it wasn't a response. This was its own thing going on. So what you're cycle. kind of mentioning is there was one small craft or a group of small crafts that went through first, followed by the big formation that followed. Yeah, that line of lights that I'm recording is over a mile long or so. It's behind the Estrellas and probably between 30 to 45 miles from my camera. And I was the... The closest so this is a pretty it. good assessment of the overall size of it. If you're looking, that's a pretty good one, yeah. Of the of the earlier object, right? That also had the, about the same amount of lights, almost as the 10 p.m. and it had the same color. So it's a hell of a confusing thing. Except the people who saw that, uh, here's the trick: the people who actually saw this boomerang, 
And then they saw the videos at 10. They said, look, nothing like it. Nothing. Completely different. Even though they looked the same. My web cameras got knocked down by cat and broke. Um, so, yeah. So, um, what happened was there, um, a call came in from Henderson. And then um, the next ca um, call that uh, Peter Davenport got was right around now. It was about 8.12 or so, and it was from Danny, retired police, or Denny, a retired police officer from Prescott. And he saw these lights, and they were reddish-orange. There were five of them. He said they were rock solid. Um, at first, he thought they were helicopters. And he's like, I don't know what this is, but it's not making a sound. So he drove home, so he wasn't too far from his house, told his kids, come outside and look at this. Everybody was like that. Come out and check this out. It was amazing. And uh, they watched, he got to see it through binoculars. And then it was seen um, moments later uh, over in Paulden. There was a guy there, Dan, who was, uh, I think, on Highway 69. And they were going to go bowling. And he saw this gliding over. And he said it was the size of a Safeway. He said it was about, he thinks it was about 1,700 to 2,000 feet up and the size of a Safeway. Now, if you Google the size of Safeway, that stupid search engine won't give you the answer. But you can measure it on Google Maps, and they're usually about 600 feet long by 200 feet wide on average. So that's about what they size this thing up normally, about 700 feet long. So then he said it glided over, and then it shot off immediately. He could just see it go like 30 miles in just a second. Whoosh, it went away. And then it shows up at the next town. A minute away, it went 30 miles. And then Peter Davenport gets a call from that place, too. So he can literally track it minute by minute when he gets a call. What? It's over this city? Now it's over this city? And then um, same thing happened. It, it glided over town, and then it shot off at amazing speed towards Phoenix. And that is when... Oh, this is also, I can tell you... Um, this is when somebody was coming in for a landing, a uh, small Cessna. And uh, Peter Davenport talked to the eyewitness, who was a retired military person. So this was not Kirk Russell. This means Kirk never, Kirk Russell really never said where he was, what airport he was flying into, because he only did two interviews on this. But that process of elimination would be Phoenix. So the the earlier um, near miss with the Cessna was, was later called into Luke Air Force Base. Now, later that night, Fife Symington, um, he ridiculed it, but later he would come back to try and, um, yeah, we're watching the beginning of my video right now. That's just started. He would Did later take credit. So uh, he almost so got, about the he got multiple crafts stacked up there. Yeah, there are there were several events that night. There were at least four events at ten o'clock alone. There weren't just two events, eight thirty and ten. Yeah. There was multiple events going on. Um anyway, when it got over right about now at eight fifteen, is what my clocks are showing, is when now if if Fife I'm I'm gonna get this quick because we're gonna hit eight thirty soon. So if Fife Symington says he saw this on TV and then he drove out and he he was waiting at this park, and all these people saw it come over. Then to give him time to get out there, because it's going to fly over Phoenix at 8.30, he's got to get in. He's got to see the announcement now. they got to interrupt friends and say, hey, Cessna almost hit something weird. Anyway, back to friends. So he, what? He saw that Got to give him 10 minutes to go drive around, because you can't get anywhere in any big city in 10 minutes. But I'm giving him 10. So it would have had to be on TV right now. And they never do that stuff, never live announcements. So anyway, right now, the thing is zooming towards Phoenix. And Tim Lee and his, um, and his uh, family are outside with Bobby Lee and whatnot. And they're watching this. They're, they just pulled up and they're home and they live over around Squaw Peak. Ooh, look and I got they're watching and, here, and here's the good part is the sound yeah. of the people. I've had it muted out when everyone's watching it. Yeah, this, this video is going to happen about 90 There's minutes from now. We're just excited. We're not. Yeah. Thank going you. by the timeline. Wait, I see. Whoa, look at them all. I got that Wait. one on video.
There's a swarm of them. Look at this. There's three of them. So I'm basically filming it as it's basically. Tom, you sound the same back then as you do now, almost. Uh, I'm still getting over this flu that's going around. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, thanks. I got four of them. Major sighting here. Hey, can I just say real quick, Sean? This is so powerful having you look at the clock and tell us what was happening at those minutes. This is just amazing. Thank you so much for doing this for us. So, yeah, you're you're welcome, Decker. Thank you, um, Mr. Decker. So, yeah, so anyway, it's heading towards town, and this is where the artist, um, Tim Lee, would be drawing the pictures that he first saw an oval coming towards them. It came Mm -hmm. right towards him. Flew right over them, and they saw it, and so they got a real good look at this. Right, they got the one of the closest looks there was, and and he and they decide they they describe the the um, the lights as swirly, like a yellow street light swirling, and they were docked into the ship. And he said it was so close, his son um, could hit it with the tennis ball, and he's like one arm of it went down this street. And another arm of it went down this street and it, it flew, flew over. So that's going to happen in about 12 minutes. But they're watching it at this time coming in. And at the same time, Fife Symington's got to be in that damn truck driving around looking for Squaw Peak. Um, so as we go, um, so Luca Air Force Base would also have to be scrambling their jets right now. Um, you can use... Um, Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can take off from a jet from Luke Air Force Base. I bought a, an F-15, and I did this. And by the time you get over the intercept range, which is 7th and Indian School, where they intercepted the boomerang, um, I think that was about 828, 829. So they'd have to, it takes two minutes to get there. They'd have to take off at 827. Uh, so I really worked this timeline from multiple angles over the years. So that means they're getting ready. They're getting their guys flight suiting up, warming up the jets. You just can't get in a jet, from what I know. Hit the gas button and launch. This isn't Battlestar Galactica. You know, helicopters and all that stuff take time to warm up, get everything running. Exactly. So they have to be doing that now. Um, because they did get a call. They did have the call in. But like Francis Barr was husband was saying on the uh, Showtime uh, special that happened, and they covered this. You just don't have jets that stand by and take off because one dude called something in. This could happen. You heard the team swatting. This would be like aerial swatting or something. It don't happen, man. Um, so they must have knew something was going on in order like, hey, those black boomerang things are back. Maybe it was like, let's go after them. We've been seeing them before. Well, um, so this number real quick. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, those kind of ready squadrons, which we have for like our nuclear bombers, even with them, those guys who are on standby like that, it still takes them about nine minutes from the time they get the call to get in the plane and get the plane checklist done and get on the runway. So you're absolutely right. This isn't something that just happens quickly. Well, Phoenix is, um, Luke Air Force Base has two jets that are part of the protection group for Air Force One and Air Force Two. So when the president gets or vice president gets on a plane and brings, let's say, Speaker of the House, senators, any VIPs and executives, these things take off and they escort the jets or the Air Force One. They just don't let that thing fly around. They always have two jets behind it. So, yeah, these are the jets that took off to intercept the boomerang. Interesting. What if the what if the Air Force One have happened to be flying over? Who do you who do they go for? I, I would say Air Force One. So the thing is is right now the boomerang um, is probably over New River, um, Arizona. Um, we know that in about six minutes it's going to be recorded by Terry Proctor, and he's a pilot up there, and he recorded the 8:30 event and the 10 p.m. event. As soon as this happened. Um, he said the 10 p.m. were flares. Okay, television never went to him and let him say that. If they did, they didn't air it. No, those are in the um, sky. But he also wasn't. You know, we saw this guy in the Discovery Channel. He never did any other interviews. Right. He didn't know what um, the 8:30 object was. He filmed. Um, we know it was um, filmed at this time because timestamps and phone call, cell phone records and stuff like that. When you get billed. On the exact time you made the calls is right there. 
Um, so he's about the he's outside probably sky watching now or doing whatever. He's a retired pilot. He had a high eight ca uh, camera ready, and he recorded the boomerang. Now he had been recording um, since he lives in the elevated area. He can look down on the valley floor and see for miles and miles. And he had been recording flare drops since January. Over and over and over, he's been watching these flare drops. This was part of Operation Snowbird that he was documenting and Lynn Katai has been documenting, documenting, except she's hawking that stuff and selling all that stuff off as books. And she's just pointing towards the bombing range and getting orange orbs all the time. So the object, um, the boomerang object, which is people said was a mile long. I talked to so many people. Um, I have a, an interview that I found from Jeff Rents where after five years after this, they talked to some of the best um, 830 witnesses. And if you look at each one of these, and then when you start extrapolating that there's hundreds and hundreds of these, then it starts filling in. Well, there's a bunch from this city and a bunch from here, large clusters of people in Phoenix, uh, smaller clusters in Dewey, um, Paul and Prescott, maybe one or two people in Kingman, um, not as many reports in Tucson, um, mostly because it, it got there later in the night, but it, it traveled a, a great distance. When it was over Phoenix, it, it, I mean, it takes like at least an hour to go from South Phoenix to Tucson, going like 80 miles an hour, and that thing got there, so that couldn't have been a glider. And when it went from like Paulden to Prescott, it, it jumped like 32 miles in one minute. That's 1,800 miles per hour. That's Mach 2. Blimp, stuff blimps can't do that. And it slowed down instantly. What blimp can deaccelerate from Mach 2 down to zero? This thing did. Um, and there was another witness that the, she described the five lights on the boomerang as it was coming into town. And she said these were the main lights, like these were searchlights or something. She described them. And she said under it were hundreds and hundreds of um, smaller lights on the belly of it. Um, so it seemed like a flying city. And everybody who saw it that I talked to had like post-traumatic stress disorder. They couldn't get this thing out of their head. And I think this happens with a lot of um, really good UFO sightings is you kick yourself in the ass later for not recording it. You tell your friends and people don't believe you. And you go outside all the time, like like tonight, searching for it again, hoping to get what you should have got the first time you were there. And I'm out looking and I have all this system, but I got the, everything the first time I was there. But I get why people don't. Um, and they, they're out looking again and again. Uh, astronomy sales went through the roof after this in town. Everybody started buying telescopes. Um, they wanted to, to get ready for it coming again because sometimes the, it comes, you know, back the next day and then it'll come back at patterns. An interesting um, fact about this is there's a trailing light that trails behind this um, large group. We don't know what that is, but it's a thing. Um, it's also seen in the Hudson Valley recordings. If you look at the Hudson Valley recordings, you'll see it also has a trailing light. And this is a lot like the Hudson Valley. If you look at um, as Lieutenant Ryan Graves um, and what he was drawn of the gimbal, the gimbal was actually a trailing light that was behind a boomerang of five circle and a cube objects. I was about to mention that. That's amazing. Yeah. So there's a pattern here that goes spans decades holograms and stuff don't explain this blip stealth blimps and trailing lights and the gimbal this is all slowly tied into itself when you over time can piece these dots together it, well, right these things have been seen throughout time right i mean this isn't just a, a one-off incident i'm 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 pretty sure i've heard multiple stories of people describing these exact same lights in different cities over a span of decades, correct? Tom, don't you have videos of these things like over Russia or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've collected some videos of the boomerang over Russia. Best video I've seen on the boomerang so far. Two of them are parked. At, like I, I say, Pardon. they come in twos. And this guy, multi-camera, sh shoot. Different, 
notifications. All those Russian guys have car camera uh, for the insurance. They have cameras in their car. So anyway, these guys had a, a camcorder and they're filming two boomerangs with maybe seven lights apiece parked, just hanging in the sky for over 10 minutes. And the UFOs undock. I, I've talked about this, how they dock and undock and switch around. They do all that yeah. in this video, everything. They dock. And it's like they they fly around in a lock solid V with the nose down like this for some reason. And then when it decides to stop and hover, it's like, okay, you can get out and move around a little bit, but stay close to the, the boat, I guess. Right. It kind of reminds me of a space yacht, you know, like our – the, the rich people in their yachts have their helicopters and their little boats inside the bigger right. boats. This is sort of like that. It's a big ship and it has littler ones that move around. seems that way, but we don't have good daytime footage of, of this at all. But it's, it's very weird. The last time this was sighted that I know of was uh, over in Ireland, Ireland um, in 2022. And is this any? This doesn't have anything to do with like the Be Belgium triangles that flew over Belgium to the UK in the night and uh, the UK in, in the nineties. Is it? That was a much smaller craft, I think. Yeah, that was. Um, I think they got that one on radar, dropping like five thousand feet in a second. That's an interesting case. And then they have some hoax photos on that one. It was a smaller. If it was real, it was smaller than this thing. Yeah. Again, this thing is well over a mile. You're saying in, in distance. It's right? not. Alien scientists, I know you probably came here from Reddit. It's not the troll from Air, uh, JP Aerospace. That guy just likes to troll stuff to, to get his startup some money. He doesn't have any proven technology. His website um, had malware on it for five years. The guy's a zero. So another person who likes to talk a lot but doesn't have much to show for what the conversation is. Yeah, just show show us a video. It's 2023. This happened 26 years ago. Where is one video of of their air blimps? And they're not classified. This is just a private company. Yeah. And you, this wasn't something floating on the wind. This had its own propulsion system. Right. These people not listen when it went from one town to 32 miles south in one yeah. minute. There's no blimp that can do that. If, I'm, if I might bring this up. If the SR-71 barely can If any of the that stuff speed. that we see is from the government, the main problem we have is the lies and misinformation and disinformation the government is knowingly putting out there. So is there sometimes going to be a, hey, I think it's this, I think it's not, I think it's something else? Yeah, we're going to get that a lot, and it's designed to be that way by the government for a reason. That's the only way they're going to keep the truth out on so many well, levels. I'd love right, to say well, a lot of this stuff is is from us. But considering what year it was created in, and, you know, it wasn't just one. There were multiple things going over, and you saw that it's multiple nights. It's not like it just happened on one night. And then to say it happened on those four nights, and then it never happened again. No, those those flares kept going off all summer. I yeah. drove down there and filmed. Yeah. Um, Weren't you checking, uh, uh, tracing down the Big Red, as you called it before, too? Uh, we, that's when I got introduced to the red UFO, uh, when yeah. I was chasing, uh, military operating, uh, area when they would go to do a training right now is when it would be intercepted, um, over seventh and Indian school. Uh, there was a call that came in, um, on that night from, um, I believe Luke air force base from a guy who said he unloaded the gun camera footage from the jets. Uh, when they went over, um, and intercepted this, we have multiple reports that at that point the boomerang was went up in the air to about eighteen thousand feet. Um, they shot. Yeah. Um, I that, I think they had. I think they were called lantern two targeting pods, which are um, their thermal things attached to the F fifteen jets. And they lased it, and they said they got white noise. So I guess that's jargon. Um, that thing jammed it. So again, yeah. like with Tic Tacs and stuff. Yeah. When you try I, getting target locks, it yeah. won't let you. If I could just break in here for one minute, Tom, would you look at that? We're an hour and a half in and it's still freaking rocking. Um, I just want to go ahead and thank everybody for having a good time tonight. And remember, if you haven't uh, give us, given us a thumbs up, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't given us, if you need, think we need a thumbs down, go ahead and, and give us a thumbs down. If you could do us a favor, please go ahead and tell us what to do in the comments below, we will try to up our game as much as we can. 
We give 100% here at Disclosure tonight, and it's amazing having uh, legends like Tom King and even our regular viewers and Dave Scott coming out tonight to talk on Disclosure tonight. You know it's something uh, special when guys, guys this great are coming out, even uh, Rick Doty and everything. On that note, I also want to go ahead and thank all of our, uh, uh, if you want to call it, people giving us super chats tonight. I haven't asked, asked a lot. A, I'm not feeling good. B, I don't want to let the conversation happen. I want to thank Buddy and Spiffy, who just threw one in. Charles Kerr. Royal Morning Blue, thank you very much. Absolutely, your your donations are not going on and shown. I, I've tried to show them during the conversation. Ingrid Cold, move along, citizen. Nothing to see here, better believe it. Abe Troff, thank you very much. We appreciate that. The, the thanks, yeah, Dave is right in a lot of respects. And we do need to demand. <laughs> Block on my face, that's okay. At least people on mobile can see it. Uh, Charles Kerr, thank you very much. 808 Roadkill, thank you, 808. Appreciate it. Followed by Kira IAM, Curtis Bartell, and of course, War on Morning Blue. Most importantly, if you haven't gone and given us a, a, a uh, subscribe, go ahead and do that. No, I'm not ending the show as people think I am. This is just to go ahead and say, hey, please do what you need to do. Please continue on, Tom King. Man, that's awesome from your audience. A great amount of super chats. So thanks. I know everybody it's great. And people thought usually show. when I start doing the thanks and everything, they think it's the end of the show. It's kind of not. I just wanted to throw it out there because unless you ask people, you know, we're we are racing towards six thousand subs. But the only way we're going to get there is from viewers who come to the show and actually hit that subscribe button. If you don't ask, you don't get. So at this point, the object has basically left the valley and went black. Uh, that turned its lights off um, again like people who got these conspiracy theories that they they go out and they, they get this theory and they say it's this and then they go out and they they spin the, the price is right wheel looking until that thing comes up to match and then okay it's this like for instance a tens a tens in formation for the yeah. 830 this thing folded up its wings and shot off um, all of its lights went off at the same time when the jet came up to intercept it. You can't get planes that do that. Oh, the, wh where did they land? I have the FOIA from um, Tucson from that night of all the jets that landed. There, there were five of them. Those were the jets that uh, dropped the flares. But that was, you know, that's 85 miles south of here. This thing flew from Vegas. Where do these jets land? Who's Air Force Base? Who are these pilots, these A-10s? None of these people ever came forward and said, yeah, it was just me and our crew. They they did that later with the flares, but they never did that in 830. Right. Nobody can come forward and prove they had anything to do with any of this stuff at 830. We still can't even build this technology yet. So this thing right now is probably sitting around it's getting close to casa grand arizona if you know the location um and about 20 minutes from now a huge triangle sighting is going to happen um at nine o'clock this was seen by different people but it wasn't seen as as often as the 8 30 event for instance this was seen by max uh, uh, saracen and his wife and i met these guys they were some pretty wealthy people live up in carefree arizona they had no reason to go out and talk about this. They had every freaking thing to lose by going on TV, saying, here's where our names, here's what we do. We've been to the White House. We've met the president. They're not it's just some clowns. They saw this black triangle, and they said it had plating under it. They didn't see the boomerang. These guys live in a different part of um, the Phoenix area. Phoenix is almost as big as L.A. square miles wise. A, a different flight path that this took. This thing would just went straight south. Um, during the course of the investigation, late, later in the months that would follow, other people would come in. They'd be interviewed. All these people were interviewed independently. It was, this wasn't done in a, a group method until everybody was interviewed independently in different rooms, asked to give drawings, witness statements. Nobody got any photos of this stuff. Yeah, Most, most were in shock. Um, so anyway, th there were some other people that we met, um, they were in a different part of Arizona and they saw the triangle later that night. And this one woman saw it in the backseat of a car and she said it was so huge that if she was laying back and held up a newspaper, like how this, big was it? it? It would, the newspaper, it would fill up the newspaper at arm's length. Um, 
because she said it took a minute or two to fl to fly south, and they were heading north from Tucson. Tucson into Phoenix. It was going from Phoenix to Tucson. They were going about 70 some miles an hour. It took two minutes to go under the thing. It was humongous. And we think that what happened is the boomerang met up with the triangle and they docked and probably took off or something. They, this might have been the first two objects that were seen um, coming out of Las Vegas. It's it's hard it's hard to say uh, the scale of this is just off off the chain, um, and hundreds of lights on the bottom of of this ship. Most people just saw the seven main lights. There are a few people who would see this through binoculars, and they would say that each of the five lights were actually three lights together. So there were there were a number of sightings like that. Out of the hundreds of them, maybe eight or nine different witnesses from different parts of the state said that um uh, comparing this to the roswell incident the roswell incident had over 100 maybe to 200 people that they they interviewed and they documented that story and their story overlaps it makes sense this guy knew this person these people tell a consistent story there's a consistent right. narrative they tell with this it's the same thing it's they all describe almost the same lights the color is pretty consistent. Um, sometimes there's discrepancies. Was it five? Was it seven? But like the Russian video teaches us that they they join together or they split. So that's how you can go from five to seven if, if it's this type of thing. With this case, we're looking at at least 750 people were interviewed. So that's you know, six, seven times what we had in Roswell, but then maybe 10,000 people. It happened all throughout the whole state. The government slowly got dragged into it. This is maybe on, on the scale, you know, 100 times, 300 times what Roswell was with witnesses. It was just amazing. Uh, there was a guy who did take videotape of this. Let's uh, get through this. His, his name was Richard Curtis, and he was a professional um, photographer or videographer. And um, he got a hold of Frances Barwood when Frances Barwood went public. And she gave her number out and said, hey, if you've seen it, call me. I remember calling her and giving her my update. Met her in person many times. Um, and she collected a lot of information. And she sat there and talked with each person on the phone, however long they wanted to talk. Uh, I, mean, I don't even know what side of the political spectrum she was on, I think. Just I knew she was on, I think, a, a city council or something like this. This cost her her job. But anyway, um, she Richard Curtis got a hold of her, and um, she had all women that worked for her, no men. And they and they said, uh, uh, he said, I got a really good video of this boomerang. And on this, you can see the city lights reflecting on the belly of the ship. Interesting. So um she said okay and then um i don't know i didn't yes. i wasn't a part of their conversation but um two guys knock on her door and they're dressed in suits men in black and um they said we're here for the tape and he's like oh you're here for the tape oh okay here and he gives them the tape and, he, and he's thinking well francis sent over some drivers or something oh, to get it oh, hold on a second there tom i need to find this and find where did it go? I've dealt with my I've I've dealt with Michael Horn. I've seen all of Billy Horn's stuff. It, it, Artie, get over here. Stop eating cupcakes. If you're looking for things that happen, look in a different direction. Just trust us on that one. Artie, get over here. Sorry about that. Dogs are catching food. Is something that popped up in there? Yeah, I, I meant I've seen his name pop up before, but. Scheister, is all I'd say. Continue on, Tom. Sorry about that. So these two guys show up at Richard um, Curtis's door, say they're there to collect the tape. They got black suits on, black hats. Um, they're not from ZZ Top. And he never sees this tape again. So later he calls Francis and he's like, hey, did you get the tape? She's like, no, I didn't get it. He's like, well, your guys came over and picked it up. And she's like, I don't have any guys working for me. I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, well, two guys came and they got, and he's like, I didn't make a copy. So this was confirmed during our investigation. One of the guys who was 
um, assign Dr. Michael Tanner to go out and collect most of the eyewitness um, reports because he didn't have a day job. Um, he, he worked at Village Labs for Jim Della Tesla, so he could work this. All of us had day jobs, and um, so these guys, so they could go out and work this nine to five and weekends. So he went over to uh, Richard Curtis's house. Michael confirmed he had professional gear up, up the, you know, just like Village Labs had professional recording equipment. This guy had professional recording equipment. Why did, would he make it up? He went on the local news and talked about it on Fox 10. I got a clip of that on my site. Um, and he doesn't, he looks kind of ridiculous. Everyone on social media just bags on the guy and says, yeah, he's probably a liar or he's a grifter. Everyone's a grifter. Um, or, or he made a fool of himself. He had nothing to gain out of it. So yeah, that happened. And there was one tape and I, I think the, the, that was the FBI. The FBI was, we were told by MUFON, who said they called the FBI on us, um, that we were all going to prison for this and they were taking us all down. They were taking down Barwood first then they were taking down village labs and they did. Um, they took them down. At least they hit them financially. Then they wanted to go after every one of us and make examples of all of us. Who were these people? This was the late Richard Motzler, who was a, a, a terrible excuse for a human being. Another one of the scandalous people, uh, that were employed for MUFON, that MUFON doesn't do a damn thing about these these dogs that work for them. Yeah, Him and I had it out two, in 95, two years before this happened. So when he or it, I had recorded it that the day after, March 14th, his blood boil. Uh, it was him. It was Cal Korf. Cal Korf claims his birthday's March 13th. Yeah. And he said his phone rang off the hook that his birthday was ruined because all these people were calling him about UFO reports. Nobody calls Cal Korf on the night a UFO happens and calls him live. That's a lie. He didn't yeah. investigate this. If you look at Wikipedia, it's all run by the debunker narrative. Um, it looks maybe Michael Shermer edits that page, but they're claiming James McGahee investigated this. And some guy named looks like Captain Kangaroo, um, Sh Robert Schaefer or something. Um, says their flares dropped by an A-10. None of these people investigated this. There were five of us that investigated this. There were no debunkers. There were nobody. I nobody gave copies of their videos to these people. They didn't ask. I do have to say something unrelated in my usual off the ball, off the wall way. Cupcake, Go for it. cupcake stepped into something. And I found it between her back toes and all kind of squished in there. Yeah, one of those shitty situations. Going to clear it out. When I'm done, I looked at the napkin. It was in the sh all the little circles were was in the shape along the edges of two edges of the napkin in the shape of the Phoenix Lights. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear a cupcake stepped in some Twitter. <laughs> exactly. Got to have some fun with it, though. But it's just, you know, one of the things. Yeah, so, so anyway, continue with Cup. Oh, no. It's been a great show, man. Great having you here to talk about this whole situation. You, you, you experienced it firsthand. This isn't just like someone actually going in and talking about it, who read about it, or who's watched some videos. You were there, and you were part of it. Now, the one thing that I'm sure a lot of, if it, there's a lot of new people on the show right now who are watching us, who don't know your personal story, you, can you tell us why you wound up in Phoenix to record this in the first place? I didn't really get seem to really dig that into my mind too much till 2019, or yeah. I would have probably brought it up before. Um, I moved here in uh, May of 1995, and sometime um, in early 95, I had this dream about a huge UFO, and I, I didn't know where it was. It was Phoenix or Albuquerque. It was, a, it was an Independence Day type of situation type dream where this life as we know ended. There were this ship was 70 something miles long. It was a big circle. And for once, people stopped talking about crap and started talking about nobody was talking about, you know, regular stuff. This yeah. is the only story, all, the only story at all time. Anytime. But what, what part of the country the were you living in when you had that dream? South Dakota, so that it was no good to them there. Right. I this was so explicit. We had a, a blue Jeep Wrangler in it. Um, these this ship was vacuuming some people up. It was a military clearly a military part. operation. 
Um, these weren't scientists that were taking over the planet. These were heavily armed, half-breed humans, half gray, half human, six feet tall. Wow. Um, they had something. I don't know what it was, something they were holding. I assume it was sh sh shoots at you something. And, uh, yeah, so I thought, that's pretty cool. We got to get down there. And, Either, and, and you know, it, was, it was real enough to you to know that something was coming to pack up the family and move the hell down to near Phoenix, where you actually witnessed it six months later. No, no, that uh, that that was 95. That's two years later. Okay, two years Indep later. I'm sorry. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the independent movie Independence Day hadn't even came out yet. Yeah. That came out, I think, July of 96, something like that. But yeah, it was the it was this dream was heavy motivation. We even had a blue Jeep by the time we drove down there. So I said, holy crap, it's coming true. Got the freaking car. Um, yeah. you know, I got the proper thing from the dream. What else is gonna line yeah. up? Lots. That does uh, complete it. Problem and is, I've already we got the car from my dream. I just don't want them to come from the north like they're supposedly going to. Yeah, it, we lived in a town that had a dead economy. It still is a dead economy. I don't even consider that area civilization. I mean, there's there's <laughs> rocks in the middle of the Pacific that got more civilization going on than that place. So it was a win-win moving down here. And yeah, about two years something later, um, yeah, about two years later, uh, I geared up, had that Super VHS camera. Um, I was out that night because uh, I was doing all daytime uh, sky watching. I was filming the Mexico City type hockey puck stuff. So I'd film those maybe at least six, seven times, some decent videos um, before the Phoenix Lights. I would went on the local news about a month and a half before and said NASA's wasting their time with rovers on Mars. Uh, aliens are right over our head then bingo just a month or two later i was back on channel 10 a gun going yeah guess what happened last night so tom i guess you've got that same feeling as well that seti is nothing but a big psyop to go ahead and distract us and think there may be life way the hell out there but probably not because life is so you know uh, uh rare but now they say there's over 100 million planet uh planets in our in our galaxy alone that are ripe for life like us so it's just uh you know we keep on learning more and more about it every single day and uh where it could take us well they can't SETI. SETI is in a position where they can't admit one uap sighting is real not even if the military comes out and confirms well they've been it. looking just then, out in deep it, space it's, not it's it's like a million dollars with the egg on their face you know well, it, it's like so you you duped us the whole time that we should listen to static these things were sitting there abducting people and you you were you you smirked at that and then you took your 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 crazy stuff and you listened to s static from a billion years or ago. to look yeah. at our space agency who's been ignoring the things that have been coming into their live feed cutting it out and then focusing on my god we might be able to find signs of microbial life on another planet when we've already have other stuff going on here that we're just forced to ignore. Yeah, yeah, there, this is a, a just a, a difficult situation no matter what angle you come at yeah. it, whether you're a believer, a doctor, experiencer, a scientist, or a skeptic. Uh, the, we're at the mercy of a government who's lied to us about everything all the time, everywhere. So how are we going to, this is such Stockholm syndrome, how do you then tr trust them when they are, you know, how you trust the like the, the husband that's beating you to, to be nice, you know? Yeah. You, you got to get out of that. How do you how do you trust the pathological liar that I used to be married to? Hello, Maria. Um, yeah, someone who you listen to and you believe, and they're telling you all this stuff. Yet everything that's coming out of their mouth is just fear, bullshit, and fantasy. But they come across completely convincing. Well, I try to get to the point where I filter that out as. Um, just background noise. There's yeah. dogs barking, looking, trying to chase the tires on cars. It could be a, a a whole waste of time. One thing I've learned a lot in the last 12 months is I need to just manage my time real carefully what I'm doing. I got a lot invested in gear and time, and I need to focus that and then family too, and then just do a, a decent balance with that. And I don't have time for the other stupid shit. Yeah. I won't get nothing done. You know, if Twitter existed now, if you think that people didn't get any video 26 years ago, they wouldn't get nothing now. 
Everybody's walking around with that thing in their hand that they're addicted to, and they ain't looking up. Hardly anybody. Like, we had 10,000 people at least see this 26 years ago. What would we have tonight? 10? Because everybody's doing this. Nobody's up doing that. Back in the, in the 90s, uh, we didn't have cell phones. We sat around socializing. Uh, we, di we didn't have an instant attention span and all that stuff. Might be worse today. The, the only thing that I could say is if this happened uh, today and this case would start all over again, the infighting with these UFO groups would start right up. Um, I would probably ignore that and start going right after surveillance tapes and trying to I, I'm not even sure if th this should be aired. Like, you can't work with the FBI because it, it, they'll just take your idea and steal it. Like, the, the boomerang back in the 90s would have been recorded on hundreds and hundreds of surveillance cameras. All these major high-rises have them. They've always had security domes on them. And they would have had um, VHS tapes and stuff like that. Um, Sky Harbor Airport probably has somewhere minimum 400 cameras on that thing and nowadays i mean there's 400 of them in the parking lots alone you get within 10 miles of that airport you're videotaped from just cameras pointing everywhere we got jails we got prisons we got federal buildings we got courthouses these things all have cameras pointing up in the sky and then now we have neighbors and stuff um almost about every fifth house down the street has camera systems like mine, except unfortunately they're pointing down. So I would go after that type of stuff today. Yeah. I would go after that type of surveillance stuff, but you would need the power of the FBI to get it because you ain't going to go down no big bank yeah. or you ain't going to go to no airport and they start handing over security tapes, right? What would you guys do? Well, this would be a good idea for the audience. Now, like what, what would be the best way to learn from any of the mistakes that happened 26 years ago and try not to make those again. Record as much of the video as you can. Don't end it short. Get as much coverage as you can. Stabilize the image as best as you can. Uh, write down the information after you have it so it stays fresh in your mind. Those would be the, my biggest suggestions for anything. Uh, and as Tom King would say, don't record it in portrait. Go to landscape. <laughs> you know, I've been I've been seeing a lot of um, uh, ring cam footage of oh, yeah. strange objects in the sky on on Reddit and other UFO sites that you know people are submitting their footage to. So you know there are cameras that uh, that are getting some of these things. But but you know you were saying about like the parking lots. I think in buildings most of those cameras are pointed down. They're not necessarily pointed up in the sky. Mm -hmm. So I don't. Uh, know how often they would catch something you know that's high in the sky well well it's ring cameras they have a fisheye lens they're not pointed down they're pointed out and they're picking up a lot of stuff that's going on in front of people's places and there's been a bunch of things that have flown around that you know some of them beg to question what the heck they are now there was a video i saw god i'm trying i can see it it was a really good uh, uh capture from a a GoPro 4K that was out set up in someone's backyard catching it, and they caught a freaking unbelievable great video of what looked like a uh, cigar flying over their house where it had this spinning electric field that kind of went behind it and pittered out. I wish I could. I'm, I'll, I'll have to see if I can go back and look for the, some of the videos I may have been in where I saw it, but I remember reviewing that video, and it was pretty compelling back at the time. And it, it, just, it just takes us to get out there and have cameras, cameras that can they can copy the feed but more importantly intelligently go through it the word intelligently and tell you where there's something real for you to need to look at because you know what that can be like sometimes if you've got like hundreds of hours of stuff to fish through and only a couple good minutes of data coming out of it just you need some kind of good intelligence system with machine learning that adapts on the fly and takes in the feedback from so many good different things to help and get there and it's where i was even talking with tom king uh, just last week about, uh, you know, it's almost we have all these different desperate platforms that are coming out there for uh, recording UFOs and uh, analyzing the data and doing the image analysis and everything. And these things will be trained by the initial people who train them, but also the data that comes into it. 
And what we truly need is this collective mindset that comes from all of these different platforms that helps give us this machine uh, learning uh, system that has a lot of good data coming in it that we can bring up quickly versus all these desperate systems. Now, the big thing we've got issues is right now the systems with Enigma Labs, with Ryan Graves and a whole bunch of these other organizations, MUFON, they're putting all this data together, but they're keeping all the systems and everything proprietary. Even with UFO DAP, it's not like it's a open source, open uh, knowledge set for everybody to take and benefit from. Now, granted, we may run into uh, situations where people go ahead and purposely try to put in bad data so you have to have a certain level of curation going on with it. But over a period of time with enough data for the right use, we can get a system where the data can come in and the answers can come out to everybody, not just a select few who want to lock us out from it, which was something we were talking about earlier today, Tom. How does that make you feel on all these systems are coming together to record data and no one wants to share absolutely anything? They all want to keep everything locked away. Do you think with all these people, you know, giving data, they have a right to know of what's going on as well, or even the general public? Um, I'm not sure if I heard any of that. Um, yeah. As far as UFODAP, I know that's written in Python software. The software is an open source. Yeah, that's um, the software. I'm talking about the, lang the, the learning models, everything else. It's, yeah, that I'm not sure what yeah, they're doing. Yeah. I know that there's a place to upload your footage um i haven't done any of that yet because i don't know there's a there's a, a web yeah. form where you can share your footage yeah. and they're do, they're doing a, that's like a back end of that project um right. but yeah that's ron's invention he's got to be careful with his own stuff because knowing this field somebody else will take his code put their name on it and start putting knockoffs knockoffs up on ebay and then uh there's always somebody out there waiting to take your work and make money off of it yep um, right now, the boomerang would be, or the the boomerang's out of town. Um, the next yeah. object coming in is the big black triangle. Yeah, the two mile long one that has entered Scottsdale, and that thing will be flying down Scottsdale Road. There might be only realistically between six to eight people I can maybe think of that were reported this. Interesting, but I don't have access to the files of seven hundred and fifty people that yeah. Francis Barr would had or michael tanner as far as sky harbor airport i went there with my thermal camera a few times and yes they knew quite a bit about me when i went there yeah. uh i just took note when i drove in there uh, i had to plan this kind of because yeah. you just don't fuck around at the airports exactly uh, I, I was look, counting all the cameras that were watching me everything going in while i was up on the the top deck with a airport i go there with my thermal camera every now and then to test it out, make sure it's working right, right, and then test different modes and get practice with it. You got to know how to turn it on immediately mm -hmm. if you need to right now. Um, and when I went there, yeah, there's dome cameras everywhere, man, nice. watching you. And I went there with a friend, and he's like, dude, they're going to think you're casing the place like you're a terrorist doing recon for a later mission. I know. I said, yeah, hey, we're not going to be here longer than 20 minutes because – the response time could be the dudes are at lunch or something. I just don't want a bunch of cars rolling up yeah. on us going, what the fuck are you doing here? Exactly. Because the stuff I build looks weird, you know? Um, you build some amazing so stuff. I just want to bring in a quick comment here from Alien Science. It says, I want, to I, I, don't, I want it to be aliens, but I'm open to other evidence and leads. And I, I'll say it the same way. The thing is, I don't want to believe. I want to know the facts. From there, we can discern the truth. But if they're going to hold the facts from all of us, there are so many different possible directions a lot of this can go into. I think we all could deal with a, a big dose of uh, shut the lies up, shut the fucking lies up and give us some give us a, some truth because I think we can all handle it. Yeah, there's there's so many stupid theories out there. Um, I, I've heard illuminated bioluminescent ducks that had landed in a Texas <laughs> oil pond that was contaminated with fracking bioluminescent like, stupid ducks. assholes in this state yes you do when you come up with stuff like that or i've already explained wait a minute i'll say it one more time bioluminescent man. ducks yeah that got in a pool of oil from a pond in texas had flown down the whole state did mach 2 from paul and the press got 
Uh, there's nothing we got that can do that and slow down. Oh my God. You explain the facts and people go, but back to the holograms, Tom. And now, and then was it Mick West? At the, no, but these people get stuck on shit. Thanks for coming out. And then we can, I, if I spend my yeah. time going, okay, let's look through these people and, and let's look yeah. through this data. And then they go, uh uh-uh. uh, trust me, it was a hologram. And it's like, yeah. based on what? Yeah. And it's like, I have these theories, Tom. I don't give a fuck what your theories are. What facts do you bring about this? Who have you talked to on this? Well, see, did you click on this link? Yeah, just get out of here. I don't uh, want to exactly. hear about that. Get out of here, kid. You bother me. On that note, Tom, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. What a great conversation. Right. What a great show. We're just at that time when I'm, I am just feeling the waves of weirdness, of sickness come on and hit me right now. I want to thank you for coming out here tonight for the second hour of Disclosure tonight. What a great freaking... I uh, guess you've oh, been, uh, you've been again. It's it's always like talking about it the first time with you, Tom. It's it's an amazing thing that you went through. Thanks for sharing your firsthand account of this, you know, monumental event that happened 26 years ago today. I'm glad it's still alive to talk about it. I oh wish yeah, I could say that for some of the other people. But yeah, all I can say is uh, we miss you guys. Yeah, absolutely. As long as we keep them in our mind and in our hearts and in our souls. They'll be around and we'll be able to connect with them. Apparently, it's a lot easier to connect with the dead. That whole thing about heaven on earth, it's a lot more realistic than even I've been calling out as. And I love to hear that. I know I also want to thank the other people we still have back in the chat right now. Uh, Andy W., thanks for coming out tonight, my friend. Yeah, absolutely great. I want to thank Tom for giving us a walkthrough on this this, uh, anniversary. Uh, Really great to hear it. I had a few questions from the uh, audience I was going to ask, but... I've got them written down, so we can always ask. We'll hit them next time. time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for coming out, Andy. Well. Michael Sekloff, no thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, thanks thanks for all that. Uh, if you got anything, if you can, I'll be around backstage for a bit. Oh, yeah, cool, cool. Thanks. There. Michael, again, thanks for coming in. If you're around, if not, Syrup. Thanks thank for being you, here. Tom. Thank you, uh, Thomas. A great show. Absolutely. Talking Surface Monkey. You always have something great to say, my friend. Uh, yeah, that, I definitely uh, enjoyed the show. Uh, yeah. Enjoyed uh, everything you had to uh, offer, Tom. Thank yeah. you very much. And I want to say, alien scientists, if you're still watching, don't be afraid to follow the link. You followed it before. We don't bite. You're a great person. You've got a lot of great things in your mind, and I appreciate everything you do. I think everyone on this channel appreciates what you do. And that brings us down to W. Decker. Thanks for coming out tonight, West, and helping out so much on the conversation with Dave at the start of the show. Hey, my pleasure. It was great fun. Yeah. And- my thanks uh, to Tom too. Tom, you're a great friend uh, to the show here yeah. and your experiences are amazing. So thank you for sharing. With Absolutely. Us. And then that takes just down to thank little you. old me here really quick. I want to thank everybody who's still in chat right now. Alien scientists are still there. Yep. Made you a mod because you deserve it. My friend black cat 15 bu- buddy and spiffy. I always see spiffy, but spiffy there it is. Charles Kerr, Chio Rio sounds Corgi cast long shadow. At the end of the day, uh, Kriti Banas, DC, Delta Echo, Dennis Benke, Digger Dog, Dry Toast. Remember, nine out of ten aliens prefer dry toast when they eat humans. Well, remember, we're not at the top of the food chain, buddy. <laughs> Lose hell. It's, it's been said many times. Uh, Eddie, thanks for coming out. Eli McGinnis, Ingrid Cole, Jason Parker, JRD, John Dillinger, Lasso, Lord Ludacris. Uh, Mammy is here, Marcus Mandel, Metal Gaming, Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs, Royal Morning Blue, Shelly Montgomery, Syrup, Sergio Costa, The Mac Geek, and of course, Zach. I want to thank everybody for coming out here tonight, as we usually uh, say at the end of every one of our broadcasts. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone. Go back to Party City where you belong. Absolutely. We'll catch you on the flip side. See you soon, everybody. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye.